You're listening to Tim Bolkley's 5-Minute Bible. I've been thinking recently about gapping and how to introduce it to students in a class on Biblical Narrative. You know, gapping is where we have to give some input to the text to make sense of it. The places where the story leaves holes that we have to fill before we can understand it. But of course it's not just narratives where gapping occurs. It occurs very frequently in reading New Testament letters. Fee and Stewart describe reading such letters as like hearing one side of a telephone conversation. Sometimes we get some help in doing this gapping. For example, when we come across Paul's writing in 2 Corinthians chapter 11 I wish you bear with me in a little foolishness. Do bear with me. I feel a divine jealousy for you, for I promised you in marriage to one husband to present you as a chaste virgin to Christ. But I'm afraid that as the serpent deceived Eve by its cunning, your thoughts will be led astray from a sincere and pure devotion to Christ. For if someone comes and proclaims another Jesus than the one we proclaimed, or if you receive a different spirit from the one you received, or a different gospel from the one you accepted, you submit to it readily enough. I think that I'm not in the least inferior to these super-apostles. I may be untrained in speech, but not in knowledge. Certainly in every way, and in all things, we have made this evident to you. Did I commit a sin by humbling myself, so that you might be exalted? Because I proclaimed God's good news to you free of charge, I robbed other churches by accepting support from them in order to serve you. And when I was with you and was in need, I did not burden any one, for my needs were supplied by the friends who came from Macedonia. So I refrained, and will continue to refrain, from burdening you in any way. As the truth of Christ is in me, this boast of mine will not be silenced in the regions of Archaea. Why? Because I do not love you? God knows I do. As we come to reading this passage, We've got some clues already as to how we're expected to gap the situation behind it. We know about the report that the Corinthian church has received about Paul, that he quotes or summarizes in 1010. For his letters, they say, are weighty and powerful, but his bodily presence is weak and his speech contemptible. And it's, we know that it's against this that he's delivering the full speech in chapter 11 into 12. And so we interpret this speech as, to quote one writer, a wild and brilliant self-parody. And in it the Apostle demolishes the presumptions of his adversaries and restores his credibility by discrediting theirs through the use of the entire arsenal of irony, sarcasm and parody. Yeah. But the way we know this is by gapping. In this case, intelligent, sensible gapping. Gapping that we're prompted to by the text itself. And there's the rub. That's the question we need to answer. What kinds of gapping are justified, and what kinds of gapping are unjustified? In this segment I'll suggest a first or primary rule for legitimate gapping. Clearly, when gapping is encouraged by the text itself, it's permissible. That's the case in this segment of 2 Corinthians. Paul himself in the letter has given us some clues as to the background against which he's reacting. And so, the kind of reading I gave you of chapter 11, or the beginning of it, is one that the letter itself encourages. Similarly, often in biblical narrative, the way in which the gaps are left in the text provides clues as to how they should be filled, or other details were given in the text provide clues as to how the gap should be filled. So gapping for which the text provides clues to the filling or the bridging is legitimate. High on the legitimacy scale. But what about the places where the text gives no clues? that's where it becomes difficult. And such situations will be the subjects of another of these segments. Hope you're waiting for it impatiently. 
Bye for now. <laughs>